Have you ever considered whether eyewitness testimony is a reliable source of information? What if I told you this source may be less trustworthy than you think? While an eyewitness might believe they're providing accurate testimony, their memory could be flawed or influenced by a leading question, which is any question that leads or persuades a person toward giving a particular response. If a jury rules solely on faulty witness testimony, their decision is just as flawed as the memories they depend on for evidence. The issue of false witness testimony motivates psychologist Elizabeth F. Loftus to explore how subsequent information can influence an eyewitness's memory of an event. Her main focus was how the misleading wording of questions can manipulate witness testimony. In 1974 and 1975, she conducted two groundbreaking experiments that gave insight into the nature of memory and its validity in the face of carefully worded questions. In the first experiment, she collaborated with psychologist John Palmer. This experiment divided 45 students from the University of Washington into five groups. All the groups watched seven short videos of car crashes in random order. After each video, the students were given a survey with several distraction questions and one critical question. The critical question asked how fast the two cars were going when they blanked each other. Each of the five groups was given a variation of this question. Group one, smashed. Group two, collided. Group three, bumped. Group four, hit. Group five, contacted. When the results came in, Loftus and Palmer found that the intensity of the verb correlated with the respondents' estimated speed. Group 5 respondents who were asked how fast were the cars going when they contacted estimated the slowest speed on average. Conversely, Group 1 respondents asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed estimated the highest speed on average. These results highlight how participants paid attention to the wording when forming their estimation. However, Loftus and Palmer point out that it is unclear if the respondents were unsure of the speed and let the question's wording guide their answer, or if the leading question truly changed their memory of this event. While this experiment established a correlation between leading questions and false responses, Loftus wanted to determine if suggestive questioning can manipulate somebody's actual memory of an event. In 1975, she conducted an experiment which had 150 student participants divided into three equal groups. Each group watched one video of a car crash, and then everybody was asked several distraction questions about the video and one critical question. The first group's critical question was, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? The second group's critical question was, how fast were the cars going when they hit? Finally, the third group was asked no critical question. One week later, all participants were called back for a simple question. Did you see broken glass in the video you watched one week ago? The first group, given a critical question with the word smashed, claimed to have seen broken glass twice as often as the other two groups, even though there was no broken glass in the video. The participants in group one likely added the idea of two cars smashing together into their understanding of the event. Then, when later asked about the crash, they could not separate this new information from their actual memory of the event. Thanks to these results, Loftus concluded that questioning can affect somebody's memory due to the misinformation effect. This happens when information received after an experience is added to your knowledge of the event. Over time, the two are grouped until the new information becomes part of your memory of the event. Ultimately, this effect causes inaccurate memory recall or reconstructive memory. Loftus's study had real-world implications. Based on her findings, the 1976 British Delvin Report recommended that juries and trial judges avoid convictions based on a single witness's testimony alone. Additionally, law enforcement has applied the implications of this reconstructed memory hypothesis into their questioning of witnesses and suspects. Now, interviewers word questions in a way that does not lead or persuade a person to give a particular response. While Loftus's results are replicable in the lab, these findings have not been without dispute. Some psychologists claim her research lacks ecological validity, meaning her findings cannot be accurately applied to real-world situations. This is mainly because watching a recording of a car accident does not hold the same emotional impact as witnessing an actual crime. Because of this, participants are less likely to pay close attention to the event. 
a later study by Canadian psychologists John C. Uli and Judith T. Kutschalin in 1986 conflicts with Loftus's findings. It found that misleading information did not alter the memory of people who had witnessed real armed robbery. This implies that misleading information may have a greater influence on witnesses of simulated events. Another issue with Loftus's studies was that they exclusively used college students. Critics have pointed out that the results from this specific demographic should not be generalized to the entire population of witnesses who tend to be of diverse ages and educational backgrounds. These flaws have made some question the decision to let her research dictate how the law handles a single witness's testimony, and this is still a contentious issue today. What do you think of Elizabeth Loftus's research? Do you believe that leading questions can manipulate a witness's memory of a crime, or do you think they can only manipulate our responses? Please let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this psychology special. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed my video and want to see me make more. Have a great day.